episode of the Play On podcast, your weekly instalments of all things Scottish football. I'm David Simmons, and like every week, I'm delighted to be joined by Anthony Brown and Stephen Commons. Make sure you stay tuned for the next hour as we look back on the weekend's Scottish football in action, the highlights and the key talking points. On tonight's show, we're discussing Lawwell leaving Celtic. Lennon still remains, so what is next for the club? We want to hear from you guys. We are fully live and interactive for the next hour. Drop us a message with your views on any of the events that we discuss on tonight's show. You're fully live and interactive and we'll discuss it. Don't forget, if you're watching via YouTube as well, please remember to subscribe to the State of Mind YouTube channel. It'll be very much appreciated. Nip on over to Twitter as well and give the Play On podcast a follow. Right, another busy show to get through, guys. It's a transfer deadline night as well, so anything that comes in we'll be discussing. Stephen, Celtic Chief of Executive, Peter Lawwell, he's come out, he said he's going to leave his position in June at the end of the season, um, with Dominic Mackay from the Scottish Rugby coming in as his replacement. Um, as Lawwell leaves, he leaves behind a legacy at Celtic Football Club, will he be remembered for all the good he done at the club, or will this season's fiasco still be remembered? I mean, he should definitely be remembered for the good things that he's done. Um, he has overseen a period of pretty much domination from Celtic. He's he's won numerous, I think it's 29 domestic trophies. Um, he's made a lot of money for the club in terms of buying and selling players. But the way that football is and the way that football fans are, and the, the it, it's almost like running 23 and a half miles of a marathon and then getting injured in the last mile. The Celtic fans will in time probably remember all the good things that he's done but it's going to be very very difficult for him to to kind of put aside the disappointment of what's happened this year and I mean we've we've talked about this for weeks and weeks and weeks a lot of the negative things and a lot of the the reasons that people are, are kind of putting forward for why Celtic have massively underachieved this year are levied at, at his door a, a lot of the the, the problems that people are seeing are the fact that they haven't changed the manager in a timely manner, if they haven't changed them at all. Um, they they got signings in the door, but were they the right signings? Were they done at the right time? Were they did they have enough of a pre season? Then you had the whole Dubai thing. It's it it has been a unmitigated disaster this year, um, and I, I do think that it probably will hinder his, well not hinder his future employment because I don't think he'll be looking at any future employment but I think it'll it'll definitely be a blot on his copybook for his legacy. So that's your opinion Stephen, um, what about yourself Anthony, are you of the same thoughts, that last mile of the marathon that's kind of cast a dark shadow over his era at Celtic or do you think otherwise? I think Stephen's given a pretty good summation of the situation there, I think in football um it always seems to be the way that whatever's happening here and now seems to dictate the, the general narrative, rightly or wrongly. I mean, you look at Peter Lowell's reign, and generally it's been hugely successful. Yes, there's certain things you could criticise and nitpick about over the course of his whole tenure, and certainly over the past, over this season anyway. But I think over the piece, you would say it's been a pretty uh, impressive reign, and he, in ordinary circumstances, he would be able to just drift off into the sunset, fetid by everybody at Celtic. But obviously the problem is the the lingering memory of this season is going to last for a wee while in the eyes of his, certainly in his most vociferous critics. Who, you, you'll have some, some supporters who can look at it and say, right, fair enough, he completely botched the last season, but generally did well by the club. He should go with his head held high, and you'll have another element who just won't forgive what's gone on in the last six months. It's, very, it's uh, I mean, you get this, it's exactly the same situation as what will happen with Neil Lennon. Will people choose to remember in 20 years' time the fantastic midfield player, the guy that started the run to 10 in, or the run to nine in a row, as it's going to be um, as a relatively successful manager in the early part of the last decade? Or will they remember the guy who started to get a little bit? delusional almost in the closing months of his reign uh, this season. I mean, I, I guess it just depends how you, are you willing to look at the whole picture or do you just want to remember the disastrous ending? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this all comes after the weekend's result as St Mirren won at Celtic Park for the first time in 31 years. Now, Celtic boss Neil Lennon labelled the defeat dreadful, saying it was the lowest point of his six years that he's been manager at the club over the two spells. I mean, Stephen, why is Neil Lennon putting himself through this? Why is he not 
hung up the jacket and said, you know what, guys, I'm going to hand the reins over to someone else. I'm clearly not getting the results that the club deserve. I mean, I think it's a, it's not just a, a very simple one reason. I think there's probably, it's a, there's a number of different facets that kind of contribute to, to his decision not to go. But people will not want to hear this, and Celtic fans especially, but it, it, I think a lot of it will be financial. Like, he... he won't get another job in football, I wouldn't imagine, anytime soon off the back of this this performance that he's had as a Celtic manager. And it's a well-known fact he's on a one-year rolling contract. If he was to decide to walk away from that, I mean, even if it was done on our mutual consent, I think I would imagine he would have to give up a, a large chunk of that compensation payment. So I think that will have a... Have a an, like, that will be an attribute that you'll have to think about. But I also think that he is... He's a proud guy. He's he is Celtic through and through. There's no no denying that. And I think Anthony's mentioned this numerous times. Who knows Neil Lennon a lot better than I do? That he will genuinely believe that he can still turn this around. I, I mean, I, I believe I, I haven't seen the, the full press conference, but I believe in today's press conference he was he was talking as if like a new chief executive coming in and a lot of these players are going to be leaving, that it's going to be a, almost like an exciting prospect. Like he, he's talking as if like I'm, I'm buzzing for, for next season to see what, what we can do. I, I am now coming round to the idea of the fact that, I mean, everybody has just assumed that he's going to go. Everyone is talking about who's the next Celtic manager. Is it going to be Eddie Howe? Is it going to be Rafa Benitez? There's hours and hours of footage on mainstream media, podcasts, fan channels, everyone speculating about who the next Celtic manager will be. I, I think there's a genuine chance it could still be Neil Lennon next season. And I know that sounds crazy, and I don't for a second believe that it's the right decision. But if you look at the facts that the new chief executive is in a job, he, he doesn't finish his role until the 30th of, of June. So who's going to decide on a new manager coming in between now and then? Like, officially, this new guy cannot get involved with, with, because Celtic are a public limited company, so that's directors getting involved with other other companies is just a, an absolute no no. So it's 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 just a, it's such a mess of a situation. And again, if if the whole not sacking Neil Lennon from October, November, December time has all come from Peter Law being fully aware that he was going to leave at the end of the season, that to me is not a good enough reason. Um, so. Yeah, Neil Lennon not leaving. I, I, to be honest, I don't blame him. If if I if it was me and it was my legacy against the best part of a million pound, I know which which route I would be taking. Yeah, I mean Brian Watt. I'm just reading some of the comments. He makes a good point here. Uh, who's more likely to call time on Neil Lennon, the outgoing chief exec uh, with one eye on retirement, or the incoming one who might not want to rock the boat? So, I mean, does he come in all guns blazing and say, "Okay, thanks for your time, Neil. Away you go. Here comes such and such to take the jacket now in the dugout." Okay, or like he says, that's going to rock the boat a bit. Or is that what the supporters want? Do you think, Anthony? Do they want that fresh management to come in, that fresh look on the side to, to challenge Rangers for the, the title next season? I don't think there's any doubt among the supporters that they want change now, never mind in the summer. I mean, the reality is, as Stephen sort of touched on there, it's not as easy as Celtic firing the manager now because there's this state of flux now with Peter Lawwell not uh, announcing that he's leaving in the summer. So he's not really in a position to be announcing or selecting Neil Lennon's successor at the moment because then you have a situation where Peter Lawwell could appoint a manager in the next few weeks and it turns out he's a dud, and then Celtic have to pay him off. So it's, uh, or it might not be the guy that the, the new chief executive wants. So it is a very complicated situation, and I can see now a situation developing where Neil, I mean, if Neil Lennon's not had the sack on the basis of results over the past month or two, at what point are they going to sack him? I mean, losing at home at St Mirren in January to, fall, to remain 23 points adrift of Rangers at the top of the league, how much worse can it get before they actually decide to sack him? Do you know what I mean? So I think there there is a point now where maybe Celtic have decided Neil Lennon gets the rest of the season and the new chief executive will dictate what happens next. And I mean, no Celtic supporters are going to complain if the new chief executive comes in and decides to replace Neil Lennon straight away. But the problem is, as Stephen said, June the 30th, is it? I mean, that's that's probably beyond Champions League qualification matches haven't started so it, it, the the sort of intricacies of when they're actually able to make the change I don't know how that 
that works if it is going to be left up to the new guy coming in and are the other board members at Celtic just now are they willing to take on that responsibility of changing the manager at this stage I mean the, the only possible outcome is that they get rid of Neil Lennon just now give it to John Kennedy till the end of the season and then the, the new guy at least doesn't have to come in and sack Neil Lennon on day one he can his first job is to appoint a new manager as opposed to having a difficult conversation with a guy like Neil Lennon yeah, the exactly. Only, I mean, the only other thing I can think of that they might do, and like might do very quickly, very soon, is to put someone in a completely new role, because the CEO that's coming in is not a football guy. It's not someone who has had years and years of experience working down south or at a different club. This is a guy coming from a completely different sport who is who's probably very well qualified in the market and business financial side of Celtic Football Club, but he's not a football guy. So they might employ a director of football. They might go out in the next couple of weeks and say, right, we are going to go and get whoever it may be. They'll, they'll go and pull a name out of hat. Martin O'Neill is going to come in as the director of football. Um, he's going to oversee a similar sort of role that Jim Jeffries does at Hearts, that he is an advisor to the board. He's going to oversee the football department and he will advise on who should be the next manager if he decides that the new manager is needed. So they might bring in someone in the next couple of weeks who will then have the responsibility of sacking Neil Lennon. But I would hate to think that that would be Martin O'Neill because... Martin O'Neill yeah. would back Neil Lennon to the hill. Exactly, so. exactly. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of people saying, obviously, change needs to happen, especially like this comment here. It says before the European campaign starts, like what you said yourself, Anthony. Uh, people are saying as well, if this guy comes in, he's not going to rock the boat if he comes in and replaces Neil Lennon. He's going to be a club legend already. So he gets off on the right foot with a lot of the supporters on the chat tonight, that's for sure. One thing I don't get, I was looking obviously online today, having a look at the BBC Sport website, etc. And one of the one of the stories was that Liverpool manager Jordan Klopp refuses to comment when he was asked if he was considering a move for the Celtic target Ben Davis. Why are Celtic now recruiting? Uh, this must be a long thing, a long term for Neil Lennon. Then, if he's making decisions on what players are bringing in at this stage, with the OK from the board above, there must be no plans to replace him. I think with Ben Davis, it, it, it was a it was a pre-contract deal that Celtic were trying to get through the door. And what people forget is that Celtic have a head of recruitment. They have a guy whose job it is, full-time job, is to identify people who could potentially add value to the club. Because Celtic, like it or not, will always be a selling club. They'll always be looking to bring in someone, add value to them, which they have done very, very successfully over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And they'd obviously looked at him and thought, we could get him on a pre-contract. He's moving across the border. There'll be no compensation due. In fact, he's over 23 anyway, so that wouldn't have been a factor. And I think given Liverpool's situation, they hijacked this at the last minute. So I get what you're saying in terms of it looks weird that Celtic are signing people if there is a general consensus that Neil Lennon is not going to be there next season. But the whole point of having someone like... uh, uh, and Nicky Hammond and the head of recruitment is that he can identify that to what should be the manager and the board and the board can decide on whether this is someone who would add value I think knowing a bit about the player it's it, well the fact that he's gone to Liverpool shows you all you need to know I, I think he, he was pretty well respected as a, a, a player at his level in the championship and Celtic would probably look at that the board and Peter Law and whoever else is making those decisions and think it doesn't really matter if it's Neil Lennon, if it's Rafa Benitez, if it's Eddie Howe. Any manager who's going to come in is going to look at Ben Davis and uh, you would hope consider him a, an attribute. So when it was something like that, I think if it had been they'd been going and spending five, six million on a guy from the Swiss League that no one had heard of, then there would be major question marks. But the fact that it was a guy they were going to get for no fee on a on a pre contract deal, then that's that's fair play in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, because they're also um, Celtic are also linked to. Of, oh, well, I think it's already across the line now by this time. John Joe Kenny on loan from Everton. Um, both of them are loans, though, aren't they, Stephen? Is that right? John uh, Joe Kenny and Ben Davis, or is Ben Davis a pre-contract with a permanent? So, well, Ben Davis is signed for Liverpool. He's not. He's oh, he's, oh, he's just not. All oh, right, so that's done deal with Liverpool. So, Sorry. Yeah, so he he was offered a pre-contract deal at Celtic at middle of last month, and he accepted it in principle, but didn't sign the contract. Right, and. What has obviously been happening is that his agents advised him to say, listen, I've got whispers that there are bigger teams in, that are maybe looking at you. They could come in before the end of the window because what Liverpool have done now is they've just offered 
I think it's two million to Preston and said, listen, we'll buy out the last six months of his contract. And for Preston, it's an absolute no-brainer. They're getting two million for a guy that they could have lost for, for zero. Um, so that's what's happened. He's gone to Liverpool now. Um, but the the deal for um, yeah, the deal for John Joe Kenny is a is a loan till the end of the season, which I think tells you all you need to know. Like Celtic are in an absolute position of flux at the moment. Um, they they wouldn't be going out and signing long term deals and and high high fees for players, in my opinion, if if they knew who the man they, they would only be doing that if they knew what the managerial structure was going to be for next season. The fact yeah. that they're going to have a new CEO, potentially a new manager, potentially a director of football in there, it's, it's just a mess. If and if you're Rangers right now, you're absolutely rubbing your hands. You're just saying, right, wait till wait till the, the world famous fifty five gets confirmed and then we just kick on again for next year because they'll want to do what Celtic have done to them and just try and kick on and move as far away from them as possible and let Celtic try and catch them. Eh? Yeah, now I'm pretty sure this is done with a bit of tongue in cheek from Graham Bell, but we need a new manager just to keep second place. But Anthony, the way that Livingston are going, possibly if Hibbs and Aberdeen can go on a bit of a run, and if Neil Lennon can't turn this around, do you think that could be a possibility? No, no. no. I mean, I, I dare say uh, Graham maybe does believe that second place is a threat, but I personally don't. I think as bad as Celtic have become, I think there's they've still got enough there to to win enough games. They've got a reasonably decent cushion as well. They're still a little bit ahead of Aberdeen. I don't think, I mean, you can never say never because, I mean, Aberdeen could, if depending on what impact the two new signings have, they could string together the type of consistency that would be required to overhaul Celtic. But I certainly, at this stage, I wouldn't necessarily be looking along those lines. I don't think Aberdeen or Hibs are consistent enough. Um, I don't think Livingston have, are going to be able to sustain that sort of run and right to the end of the season to overhaul Celtic. So, I mean, obviously, I can understand Celtic fans being concerned, but personally, I don't think their second place is a threat. I think they've still got too much quality and they will... I mean, it's I'm saying that on the back of them losing 2-1 at home to St Mirren, but St Mirren are actually going OK at the moment. So it's although it's a pretty shameful result for Celtic, it's not like they've lost a team at the bottom of the table. Yeah, I dare say they'll, they'll be capable of getting back on the horse and picking up a few wins here and there, things taking over. But I mean that that's that's not really worse. I mean if they if they were to fall to third, then it's even more of a catastrophe. But I don't see that happening. I laughed it off last week. Like I, I think you or somebody, one of the the contributors last week said the same thing, and I laughed it off just saying, "Ah, oh, it's not it's not quite that bad." But I watched that Celtic game on Saturday, and like it's amazing what difference a ninety minute game can make on your opinion of a team. That, that uh, to me, it wasn't a surprise that St Mirren went there and, and won. Like it, it wouldn't have really been a surprise if they'd got a draw or like the fact that St Mirren won. They, they were more than deserving like, the three points. So you're looking at that and going. Do you have do you have confidence that the management team are going to be able to get that extra 10, 15, 20% out of these players to get back to even a acceptable level where they're they're winning one or two nil against your likes of St. Mirren, your Hamilton. Well, I know they beat Hamilton two 0 the week before, but it was far from convincing. They they've drawn back to back with Livingston, they drew with Hibs at, at, at Parkhead as well. It's do, do you have the confidence that this Celtic team are going to kick on and string a four or five results together which would then really bury Hibs and Aberdeen or if Aberdeen and Hibs keep sort of chipping away chipping away and Celtic keep dropping points they're potentially I agree with you Anthony to be perfectly honest in terms of I don't think over the course of the rest of the season that Hibs and Aberdeen are going to have enough consistency to do it but it's not impossible anymore last week I laughed it off thinking I mean that's just ridiculous that's not even a possibility but looking at that game I think it, there is a chance eh? Yeah, no, I'm just actually looking at something on my phone here that I screenshotted because this comment here, since the beginning of the year, we've only had uh, the fourth most points in the SPL, which is actually true. So um, this is a screenshot that I've taken and it's from a very famous forum in Scotland called Pine Bovril. SPFL Premiership Form Guide. This is from the last six games. Top of the table is Rangers, who have picked up 16 points from the last six games. Then you've got Livingston, who have picked up 12 points. St Johnston, 10. St Mirren, 8. Kilmarnock, 7. Hibernian, 7. Ross County, 7. And then under them, Celtic, with six points out of the last six games. Kilmarnock uh, are two, two positions ahead of Celtic, and I've just sacked their manager. So what does that tell you? That, that tells you everything you need to know. That... This run of form, as anybody with two eyes, or even folk with no eyes, would be able to tell you that this is not an acceptable run of form for Celtic Football Club. Like it's just, 
it's not acceptable. For, as we've seen, at Kilmarnock, never mind a club like Celtic. No. I don't think it's up for debate. There's no, I mean, we can all see it. Everyone can see it. But given the state of what's going on out with the, like, out with the, the football at the club, I think that's that's a massive contributing factor why he's still in the job. But the Celtic fans must be beside themselves. They must be furious at this situation because they not like they've they've already got their own gripes against the Celtic board with the, the season ticket money, the, the the fact that they don't they're not getting any communication from the board and all these things are happening at the club and no one's coming out and taking any responsibility. I, I actually feel a bit sorry for Neil Lennon again. Like I, I watched his interview with Kenny McIntyre on um, on BBC and he was just uh, it, it just stank of a guy who's just been beaten up from pillar to post and he had nothing left he, he, Kenny McIntyre was asking him questions that a, a, a guy who's been as media trained as Neil Lennon should be batting off and he's giving him answers like yeah the players have let me down and like the journalists are absolutely jumping for joy at those sort of lines but it's just it's just a guy who yeah, he's just. I think he's just come to the end. He's tethered, but he's hanging on in there for the reasons that we discussed earlier. Yeah, just a couple of things. Away, I, sh- I don't know. I don't know if he is at the end of his tether. I mean, he's obviously beleaguered, but I don't know if he's actually at the end of his tether. I mean, the way he was, he was. Whether I, I don't know if he genuinely believes it. He came across as a guy who is convinced he should still be the Celtic manager next summer or next going into next season. I mean, he. He seemed absolutely stunned when he was asked the question about whether he'll still be here next year. I, I don't know why. I don't know if that's all an act, but I mean, it, he certainly doesn't strike you as a guy who is for the chop. Like most managers in this situation would be thinking, it's up to the board to decide. And I know he has alluded to that, but he does genuinely seem like a guy who thinks he may still be the Celtic manager next season. Yeah, no, sorry, I'm, I'm going back to my phone here because I took another screenshot. It's from Keradine Hudson, obviously, the reporter. It must have been from today's conference saying that Celtic boss Neil Lennon has no plans to follow out CEO Peter Lawwell in the summer. He, he quotes here, why would I? Why would it be my intention to go? Peter's decision has nothing to do with my position at all or any of the coaches or any of the players. So I don't understand the context of the question at all. I think what he's basically saying there is if they want me gone, they pay my contract and they and they get rid of me. I'm not going anywhere until someone tells me otherwise. That's basically what he's saying. And I know that Celtic fans will not be happy with that and they'll be saying, oh, he's, he's ruining his legacy and things like that. But I, trust me, I went through a tenure of Craig Levine, who was a Hearts legend and the great as a player and came back with all the best intentions, the exact same as Neil Lennon did. And he could just, he just couldn't, he couldn't recognise when time was up. He couldn't recognise when it was over from where everything had gone wrong. And the, I mean, the club were, uh, we were in relegation zone. So it's be, be thankful that you're only second place in the league. Um, but uh, trust me that it, these guys sometimes just need to be put out of their misery. And that is exactly the, the situation that Neil Lennon's in. He just needs to be taken aside. Thanks for everything, Neil. Off you pop. Like, it's been well covered again, but Celtic have done this to guys like Tommy Burns. Like Tommy Burns was uh, was as much of a legend at Celtic as as Neil Lennon is. So sentiment shouldn't really come into it when it comes to something like this. They should protect him, protect the club first and foremost. And if he's not doing the job, get rid of him. Anthony, just to jump on something that Stephen said there, obviously the comparison to Craig Levine there. Craig's not went into management again. Do you think that? Well, not yet anyway, but do you think that Neil Lennon obviously acting this way is going to struggle to find another job? I mean, someone on the chat here says he's going to have to go over to China to try and rejuvenate his career or something. Do you think the way he's acting and maybe not putting his hands up and saying, listen, it's time just for me to go, do you think that is maybe going to account yeah. for further positions that may arise for him in the future? It will be in his thought process because he will, if he is given consideration that he could get sacked or he may have to resign... He will, your natural thoughts would be, but what happens next? That any human being would be exactly the same. They're not just going to jump without thinking what could happen next. They're not just going to jump because it's the right thing to do for Celtic Football Club. They're all, they wouldn't be human if they didn't think about what is this going to mean for me going forward. They might be psyched for six months, a year out of the game, which can often happen for a manager. But a guy at Lennon's age will still want to be involved in some capacity. He's, 
I mean, he, he's a very good pundit. He's a very articulate guy when he speaks about football, so he could certainly go into the punditry side of it and he won't be short of offers there. People like what he has to say. He's a very engaging guy. Um, but if he wants to go back into football management, he's going to have to drop down the certainly a few rungs. I mean, he's after Celtic, he went thinking he was taking a little step up to go to Bolton. That obviously didn't work out for him. So he had to step down and come back and rebuild his reputation at Hibs. I would suggest that if the Hibs job was to become available in the next six months to a year, there might be a few Hibs fans with Neil Lennon, but certainly there wouldn't be the clamour to get Neil Lennon that there was when he took the job in 2016. His stock is damaged, um, so he would have to look at, uh, I don't know, potentially a championship, Scottish championship. I mean, he's got a high profile, which is going to help him. He's, he's obviously played at a good level in England. He's got a good profile, so that always helps. But certainly, I think he's uh, the the marketplace that he would be looking at in terms of his next job is going to be far lesser than it would have been when he was appointed the Hibs manager. He's, he's not got the same gravitas now that he would have had four or five years ago. So that will be in his thought process. What next for me? Do it. And you, you joke about China, but it might be that he would have to go abroad because it, there's always um, there's always clubs abroad that have got a bit of money to throw about and that are keen to get a big name manager, regardless of perceived failure in their last position. So he would certainly be able to get a job somewhere, but it's whether it satisfies him. And him. he's going to. It's only natural that he's going to think, "What next?" Because you go from managing Celtic, you don't suddenly want to psych yourself for managing in the Scottish Championship again when you've just come out of there a few years ago. So I can understand them clinging on and you you refer to uh, Craig Levine. I think Glenn's profile is probably a bit higher. Craig Levine's in terms of worldwide, he would probably have a bit better chance of getting a job that appeals to him uh, maybe than what Craig Levine has at the moment. Yeah. So this one, all comes. One thing, one thing for definite, he'll not be getting the job at Queens Park anyway after Leanne Dempster's gone in there. So <laughs> cross that one off the list. <laughs> so this all comes obviously as we discussed as it finished um, at Celtic Park. Celtic one at St Mirren two at the weekend. A name that we touched on Stephen earlier. You mentioned him, Alex Dyer. Um, after the weekend's result, he left his job as Kilmarnock manager by mutual consent um, after his side lost three two against St Johnston at home. Can't say we're surprised to see him go. Really, to be honest, he has been on a bad run. But who takes that job now? Well, I know it's a tough, it's a tough one to to kind of look at because since Stevie, obviously Stevie Clark did such a great job at Kelly, but they've now that's two managers they've had now because they obviously had Alessio who came from Juventus <laughs> and mm. uh, and that he was a disaster. And then Alec Dyer obviously was a bit better um, in terms of he knew the players and it was a almost like a, a heart back to the, the Steve Clark kind of era. But yeah, they'd, they'd gone through a couple of really bad runs. I think they were seven, they were seven without a win kind of just before Christmas. And then they, they, they went on a run of three games. I think they won. And then it was another five w- without a win. So when, it, when form starts hitting those sort of figures, Boards will panic, especially in this time with, with COVID and stuff. Any team that, that gets relegated this season, it is a unmitigated disaster um, because you, you just don't know what's going to happen next season. You don't know where we're going to be financially, what clubs are going to still be able to play. and um, So Billy Bowie and the board at Kelly will probably try to protect themselves. But where they go next is, is, a, is, a, is a very, very hard question to answer because... There's a number of different routes. Do they go for an experienced guy? I know we. It seems like we're we're doing what the, the mainstream media are doing. We're wheeling out the same names for the jobs. But it, if, for me, Tommy Wright is he's a perfect fit for for a struggling SPL team. If he wants to go in somewhere that's got maybe as much of a budget, if not more of a budget than St, St. Johnston had, um, he could go in there. But would a Tommy Wright team want to play on a on a four G pitch every week? Mm, don't know. Then you've got Stephen Robinson, who's obviously just lost his job at, at Motherwell, who, who was a very good manager. I mean, he was he was getting touted for a lot of Northern Ireland job, the Hearts job, and then for some reason his messages were just not reaching the players this season and seemed to go. So, or do they go for someone completely different? Do they go for a name from down south? Do they go for a a, a, a player who's who's potentially retiring or? There's, there's been a bit of chat about potentially Stephen Naismith going there as in, in some capacity as maybe, I don't know if he's going as the manager or, or maybe a coach. Or, 
there's there's a number of routes that they could go down, but I mean, knowing how they how they work, they've obviously taken the the risky route with Alessio before. They then went for the safe pair of hands. It's it's now going to be up to them to kind of get their heads together and say, right, guys, what, what do we do next? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned obviously the surface at Rugby Park, Anthony. Do you think that the vacant Kilmarnock job is still quite an appealing one for somebody to come in and take? Oh, one hundred percent. I mean, you only have to look at what it did for Steve Clark to see that it's a, a brilliant job to get. And we're we're speaking about um, Neil Lennon there. Where would he go if he left Celtic? I dare say if he left Celtic now and the Kilmarnock job came up in six months' time when he was a wee bit refreshed and he's critics have sort of simmered a little bit. I dare say Neil Lennon would be an appealing candidate and would probably be interested in Kilmarnock. That scenario was to, to unfold because it's proved the catalyst for Steve Clark almost revive it, revitalising, reviving himself and become the Scotland manager. But part of the problem now is Steve Clark's elevated the expectations so high at Kilmarnock that just avoiding relegation will not be enough now. People want top six, they want pushing for Europe. And uh, obviously the, the last two appointments haven't gone to plan with Alessio and Dyer. So there's pressure on the Kilmarnock board now to get this one right. And I think there's three obvious candidates there. Uh, Gary Holt, Tommy Wright and Stephen Robinson. From my perspective, did, if I was a Kilmarnock fan... Gary Holt, would... Did Gary Holt not take the, the technical director job at Falkirk a couple of weeks ago? I'm pretty sure he's he's tied up now. He's He went yeah. in as a director of football at Falkirk. I, I dare say if Kilmarnock came calling, though, he would maybe reconsider. But then, if, certainly Robinson and Wright, they would be the standout candidates by an absolute mile. And if either of those two got the job, I think most Kilmarnock fans would be pretty happy. I mean, Tommy Wright's, he's, I'm, I'm really surprised Motherwell overlooked him. But equally, we spoke about the possibility that Motherwell would look there because they have a habit of maybe not going for the, the obvious appointment. Um, but I think Tommy Wright is ready-made for this job. I know you touched on the plastic bit, but I think we're being a wee bit disingenuous to him and suggesting that he couldn't play on a on a plastic pitch. I mean, he's he's got the strip bit of a, I don't know, first, whether it's fair for that reputation of playing a football team that isn't necessarily the easiest on the eye. But I think he's a very intelligent guy. He's, he's going to look at what he's got. He's going to work out the circumstances he's make sure he's got a team that plays to its strengths, whatever this... Uh, he's not a, a manager who can only play. He's probably switched on enough to play and depending on the circumstances. Now, he would, if I was uh, involved in this decision process, I would be going for Tommy Wright as number one, Stephen Robinson number two, and I would chap on Gary Holt or number three if I couldn't get either of those. But again, there's all, as you touch on, there's also the possibility... Yeah, I've got a younger guy like Stephen Naismith. And Naismith knows he's still, but obviously that would be a bit more gamble given that he's never managed before and he's a bit of a rookie. Yeah. One Naismith that we've obviously not discussed is Gary Naismith as well, who since obviously parting from Queen's Park's not really... Queen's, uh, sorry, Queen the South, sorry, he's not really got back into management yet. I wonder if maybe Gary Naismith would look at a, applying for a job like that. But that all comes after Alex Dyer left this weekend as his team went down 3-2. I feel quite sorry for them, obviously, being 2-0 up at half-time, but St Johnston done well, battled back and got the three points at Rugby Park. Moving up to Tanadice, it finished Dundee United nil, Hibs 2. Jack Ross said sometimes winning the ugly side of football will secure them a win. So, Danny McGregor rattled home. I don't know if he's in this strike. He was, certainly wasn't missing that I don't want to get in the way of that if I was a keeper uh, he put the 1-0 up and then Martin Boyle secured the three points after the break so a manager that's going right into the David Simmons Sugarly Peg Club has to be Mickey Mellon we've not mentioned him yet Stephen but he's not on a good run is he? Yeah he's absolutely not on a good run no um, I, I, we touched briefly last week on Dundee United potentially being in a bit of financial bother they, they went to their fans and asked for them to help them basically just survive for the next couple of months or whatever. They've got a massive wage bill. Their, ma- their wage bill is something like four million a year. It's yep. crazy how much money they're they're spending. I mean they, they obviously gambled to get back up into the league. They they went and spent a lot of money on Shankland, Reynolds, the Argentinian left back, I forget his name. Um they they, they went all out um and like then their gaffer abandoned ship and came to us. Um <laughs> But Mickey Mellon looked a looked a decent appointment. He'd he'd, he'd never managed up here, but he had a, a really good reputation in England. Um, 
and then he had Stevie Frail as his assistant, who's obviously vastly experienced in the Scottish game up here as well. So, um, on paper, it looked like a decent appointment. And to be honest, it has been a, a reasonable appointment. I mean, up until this week, this is the first time they've dropped out of the top six. Um, and you, people forget they're a promoted club. I know that they, we've touched on, obviously, their, their wage bill and the, the players that they've got, the experience that they have. Um, but they were down in that championship for a long time. Um, and when they came back up, I think if, if you were realistic and you were... The Dundee United chairman should have been saying, listen, I understand that we're we're putting a lot of money into this, but this year we survive and then next year we push. We have to push for top six. Like to, For them to come up this year and have to hit the top six was, was not really... Um, I mean, it's still achievable. They could still do it. I mean, St. St. Mirren and, and Livy are flying, obviously, but we've seen it go from from that before. We've seen teams who were flying just fall off a cliff for for num- a number of different reasons. People could, they could lose players to COVID. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no rhyme or reason to to what can happen in football. Um, and Dundee United could catch fire again. I mean, they've got good players. They've got Shankland. They've got um, uh, McNulty. McNulty. Yeah, McNulty, they've got Clark. They've got three probably strikers that would get in any team out with maybe the Aber- Aberdeen Hibs and the, the Old Firm. I mean, they, they've got good, good players. Um, so it's just a case of Mickey Mellon trying to get a tune out of what he's got. Um, and I think that that's potentially the issue they've got. I think that potentially he's trying to fit all these players into a system. It might might not work. Um, but I, I don't think it's, it's... I don't think they should be panicking. Uh, but yeah, he's definitely he's definitely in the club, mate. He's in the club. Uh, obviously, the other side of the coin, Anthony, is uh, Hibs got a, a much valued three points away from home as well for Jack Ross. Yeah, massive result for them on the back of the cup calamity against St Johnston. I mean, had they lost against Dundee United or even not won, I think the knives would have still been out for Jack Ross. But that's a that's a really good away win, pretty comfortable. And it's uh, just sort of settled them down a wee bit after the previous week. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily banish the memories of la- uh, the previous weekend or even the the cumulative effect of the two semi-final defeats against Hearts and St. Johnson. But it certainly reaffirms that they're a team likely to finish in the top four and possibly even in third place. I noticed on Saturday night, or it might have been yesterday, Hibs tweeted that they had the third best defensive record in the league and or third highest scorers in the league and fourth best defensive record in the league. Um, and a, a few supporters replied saying, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. What about the two semi-final defeats? So there will still be that mindset among some supporters that it's going to take more than finishing in the top four to get them back on site. But I think most fans are realistic enough to accept that if they finish in the top four, that'll be a good season. So in that regard, Saturday's win was really really quite important for them just to generate a wee bit of positivity again among a supporter base who were becoming pretty disenchanted on the back of the semi-final defeat. But obviously, the the transfer situation in the background, which I'm sure you're going to touch on, will also be a factor depending on how that plays out tonight. I mean, it looks like the two of them are... Last I checked before we came online here was that they're both going to stay at Hibs, which I think would be a boost for most supporters. But I... I was saying to you guys before we came, I'm stunned that Hibs have turned down the bid for Nisbet. I really am. I, I mean, he's don't get me wrong, he's a fantastic striker at this level and he's done them a turn this season, but two million plus for a guy who's had six good months but has blown hot and cold. Let's be honest, he's been hot and cold, particularly in the last couple of months. Now, I understand he's had off-field issues, so we've got to take that into consideration, but I, I'm absolutely stunned that they've not taken the money. Well, look yeah. at the look at the situation with Shankland at Dundee United. Dundee United didn't take the money when they had the opportunity, and he's just dropped dropped off. Like he's he's not scored anywhere near what he what he was previous. So I mean, if it, arguably, if Dundee United were to say they were in financial trouble tomorrow and, and have to sell him, they would get a fraction of what they would have got six months, eight months ago. So that 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 situation could easily arrive at Hibs. That could easily happen to. Kevin Nisbet, but then again, it could go the other way. It could, he could yeah, absolutely, absolutely catch fire. He could finish. He could finish as the top goal scorer in the league. But how much more money would Hibs get for a guy like him? 
Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you, 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 I know it's gone back a bit in time, but then you, you look at guys like Stephen Fletcher, Jason Cummings, Derek Radden. I mean, these guys were all, generally speaking, two million quid. I know that was a different era, the likes of Fletcher and Radden, but the, you can't tell me that Nis, Nisbet's a superior player to these guys. Nah. And I don't think he's a guaranteed hit in the English Championship. I think he's got a chance, but I don't the think there's is, any the chance you don't, that he could you don't know what the makeup of the, the deal was and stuff like that. Like uh, mm. what's been reported in the media could be miles wider. They could have been yeah. offering a million pound up front where if he gets a Scotland cap, if he does this, if he does that. So you don't know what the makeup of it is. So the one, the <laughs> one that I was surprised at was Porteous. I can't believe that they, did, that they didn't snap up. If somebody offered me 15 quid for Ryan Porteous, <laughs> I would snap their hand off. Nah, I'd, I'd, go, I'd, go, I'd, the I'd, I'd go the other way. I would go the other way. I would I would have I would have been more inclined to hold out for two million quid for Porteous and I'd to be more inclined to take a slightly lesser bid for, for Nisbet because I think I see what you're saying about Porteous. He's had a terrible past month. He's been way off it, but I think he's only 21 and he's short. I think there's very much um, similarities with John Souter here in terms of the guy who's come through absolutely hyped up through the roof as a teenager, probably overhyped. And now people are just looking to bat him down because they've seen him hyped up so much and they're thinking, why, why is this guy getting so much hype? But I think the reason he's getting so much hype is because he's been capable of going in and holding his own to a large extent as an 18, 19, 20-year-old, which not many centre-backs can do. And he's played regularly week in, week out. He's had bad games, he's had great games, he's had indifferent games. But there's there's not many 21-year-olds playing regularly in the Scottish Premiership. And I think that's the thing, generally speaking, he's played to a high standard and he's been part of as Hibbs said, the third or fourth best defence in the country this year. Um, I totally get he's had some shocking moments over the past month and I understand why people will be looking at that and questioning why is this guy being the subject of seven-figure bids. But for me, I, I, again, I wouldn't have been surprised if Hibbs accepted a million, but I think if you were going to push for more of either of the two players, I could understand them pushing for more for, Niz, eh, for Porteous than for Nisbet, if you know what I mean. I think Porteous has got more scope to improve and go to a different level in the next three, four, five years. Yeah, so like I said, it finished up at Tanadice. It was Dundee United nil, Hibs 2. Uh, Dundee United, their 17-year-old Lewis Nielsen. It looks like uh, he could be on a move down to Leicester City. Uh, Ryan Edwards is going to get a move to Wigan by the looks of it. Also, Hibs could be losing out on midfielder Stevie Mallon. He could be on his way to Turkey after agreeing in principle uh, to join a Turkish team over there, which I probably can't pronounce, Yeni Malaspor. We'll go with that. Um, and like you say, obviously the, the two being linked to Birmingham City, which you probably would snap their hands off for. Uh, if we move on to the game at the Tony Macaroni Arena it finished Livingston 0 Aberdeen 0 and what actually was quite a thrilling 0 no, 0 no draw it was actually quite a good game um, but obviously there's a few transfers that's happened since that game already Sam Cosgrove he's made the move to Birmingham City which we're talking about uh, quite a lot tonight that's a good bit of business for Aberdeen Stephen isn't it? Oh absolutely absolutely we, we touched on this a couple of a couple of, it was last week or maybe the week before that uh, Tony had asked What's the deal with Cosgrove? How is he not scoring as many goals? It, it, his scoring record out with penalties is is quite poor, to be perfectly honest. And I think the way that Derek McInnes played with with the out and out wingers, it suited a big guy like him. And, and don't get me wrong, he has got attributes. I mean, there's no doubt about it. There's things that I think a team like Birmingham, two millions, not a lot, not a massive amount of money for a team like that. They can say if we can get him in and we can work on these things, that then we think we can get a player out of them. Um, so, so yeah, he has got potential, but nothing more than that. I think uh, the fact that Aberdeen got that sort of money for a player that they signed for £30,000 from, from Carlisle a couple of years ago, it's, it represents great business for Aberdeen. Um, I don't I don't think, I think given, the, I know we're going to go on and talk about it, but the, the two guys that they've now brought in, I know they've only brought them in on loan, but uh, to me, Certainly, one of those players are levels above Sam Crosgrove. Um, so I think it's definitely. If you look at how things have worked out for Aberdeen, they've sold probably one of their star players or their biggest assets because they were struggling for money. But if they've got these two guys coming in alone, their their squad is arguably stronger than it was before the window started. So no, I don't think you'll be too disappointed. Yeah, Anthony, let's take that comment that Stephen made and run with it because it looks like someone could be making a return back to Scotland in that Aberdeen squad, isn't it? Yeah, Camberry, I, I think that'll be a really good signing for Aberdeen. 
I've made no secret of the fact that I really like Camberry. I understand he was a guy that sort of divided opinion among Hibs fans. Certainly after he left to join Rangers, he became persona non grata and he won't be welcome back at Easter Road at any time in the future um, because of his comments when he went to Rangers. But I mean, there's no getting away from the fact that he was a good goal scorer for Hibs. I think he scored 30 goals in his two years there. If it was even two years. Yeah, he had two years at Hibs and he scored about 30 goals. He's one of their highest scoring forwards of the last 10, 20 years. Um, and he, he, he had these moments at Rangers as well. He certainly, and there was quite a few Rangers fans wanted him to re-sign in the summer. So I don't think there's any doubt that he's capable of going into Aberdeen and making an, an impact. It's not like he's coming into a country he's not played in before. He's familiar with the Scottish game. He's got good experience and he clearly enjoyed his time here to the extent that he wants to come back. So he's going to have a lot more energy and pace than what Cosgrove would have brought to the party and he's he's a goal threat. If if you get him in the right mood and it you've got to remember Camberry's best form for Hibs came in that first six month loan period when he signed three years ago yesterday or th- three years ago in January and he had a magnificent burst till the end of the season and he ended up getting himself a good contract at Hibs. And again whenever he played for Rangers he tended to do well when on loan. So it could be that having him on loan is the best way to get the best out of Camberry because he's trying to prove himself and win a contract. So I think it's a great bit of business for Aberdeen if they can get that one over the line. Yeah, because I mean, recruitment's going to be key now for Derek McInnes, Stephen, isn't it? Because he's, he's come out and said we don't have any strikers under contract for next season. So he is going to have to recruit well. If it's a loan period and then that loan gets converted into a permanent move, like what happened with Camberry at Hibs, Anthony, as you said. But McInnes is obviously going to have to bring in somebody fairly quick, isn't he? Uh, to be honest with you, like, I, I might be completely wrong. Unless financial situations change at Aberdeen over the summer, um, I can't see either of the guys that they brought in on loan being available at a price that Aberdeen would be able to afford. Because I think St Gallen are paying him a lot, are paying Canberra a lot of money. So you would imagine they they would want to probably get some of that money back by getting a fee for him. And uh, and Fraser Hornby, who they've they've brought in as well, he's he obviously left Everton and went to, to a club in France. I forget what club it was, Reims, I think, in, Ram, in France. Ram. Um is it? Yeah, and uh, again, very highly rated. Very, did scores bags of goals for the under twenty ones for Scotland. Um, I haven't ever actually seen him play a first team game for anyone. Um, so it would be interesting to see how he would fit in. But again, similar type of player to Cosgrove, big, powerful, strong, good at holding up, technically good. Um, I, I don't see Aberdeen being able to permanently bring him in either, but stranger things have happened. But I, I, McInnes, if McInnes knows he's going to be there for next season, I think he's the, one of the more pragmatic managers. He he is consistently, I think, we, again, we spoke about this a few weeks ago, he's consistently, over the last five, six, seven seasons, he's brought in guys on pre-contract deals in January who he knew were going to build for next season. This year, with the financial implications at the club, he's probably not been able to do that as much as he wanted to. But football is a is a very different place now than it was even 12 months ago. There is going to be so many players across Europe and in Britain who will not get their contracts renewed for financial reasons. There is going to be a, a hell of a lot more free transfers this year available. So all he really needs to do between now and the end of the season is get his scouting team and himself and, and Tony Dock to, to look over and see, right, forward. The, the forward line is, is going to be where they need to strengthen most. They just need to be looking at all the out-of-contract strikers that they could possibly get their eyes on between now and then and make a short list. And I, 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 I truly believe like, his recruitment has been great at Aberdeen and he's, 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 he's done really well. There's some players that have come in who haven't, played to a level that you would have thought like Craig Bryson was a perfect example when they signed him I thought Jesus that's he's going to be a fantastic signing for Energy McGeoch as work. well is probably another yeah. one They're just guys who you looked at and thought that that's just it just makes sense it's a great signing that'll definitely work some of them didn't but then other times guys like Cosgrove 30 grand he's come in set the place on fire um Shea Logan, they got from, I think, from Man City or, or Brentford. or like He had just been kind of dotting around the lower leagues in England, doing nothing, came up and was has been one of the, the best performing right-backs in the league for the last five, six, seven years. So um, he's got an eye for a player, McInnes, and I don't think Aberdeen will be worried about next season. I think they'll just be looking to try and cement that third place this year, and he's, he's obviously done good business by bringing in these two guys. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously this talking point comes as it finished at the Tony Macaroni Arena, Livingston nil, Aberdeen nil. Livingston now extend their incredible unbeaten run to 13 games without a defeat, Anthony. That's... That's that's that is miraculous for a club like Livingston to appoint somebody who we never heard of this time last year, David Martindale. That's the kind of manager that Kilmarnock would like to attract, doesn't it? Maybe an unknown that can come in and just really bolster the squad and go on a 13-game unbeaten run. <laughs> that's remarkable. I mean, it, it might just be one of these fairy tale things that I don't want to jinx them, but it might just be one of these fairy tale things that just lasts for a temporary period and then. In six months' time, we're saying, remember when David Martindale and Livingston were flying when they're in a relegation battle next season. But hopefully that doesn't happen because I think it's he's been a breath of fresh air over the past few months. And he's really sort of, it's been the one real feel-good story, I think, in Scottish football, the, the David Martindale-Livingston renaissance, emergence, whatever you want to call it. And to be honest, it would, it would be a really good story if they were able to get themselves into the top four and qualify for Europe. I don't think that will happen. I think they'll run out of steam at some point or and Hibs and Aberdeen will have just a bit too much. But certainly they're giving it a right good shot. I mean, the, the, as you, the third, it's it's not like they're just uh, picking up results against weaker teams in the league. That's Aberdeen and Celtic they've drawn with in the last few weeks. So they're, they're picking up, they're capable of going toe-to-toe with anybody in the league. Yeah, absolutely. And make the, sure you stay tuned. Is, see, see if you look at if you look at Livingston's next few fixtures. So they play Aberdeen tomorrow, right? Yeah. But then they've got they're at home to Hamilton. Eh, sorry, no, no, no. They are at home to St Johnston, at home to Hamilton, away to Dundee United, away to St Mirren, and at home to St Johnston. And then they play Rangers on the third of March. You you could conceivably what they could conceivably go and beat them for the rest of those games. And maybe the Rangers games are a bit of a push, but imagine they went unbeaten until the third of March. It'd be incredible. Eh? <laughs> And what I was going to say to the camera there is obviously make sure you stay tuned to our State of Minds YouTube channel because uh, we might have an exclusive interview with David Martindale coming up in this month. So do make sure you stay tuned to the YouTube channel for the whole of February. Uh, we move on. Rangers never had a fixture this week, as did Motherwell. I don't think they never had a game either. So, But just a little bit of transfer news. Rangers, they've allowed Derby County to open talks with uh, George Edmondson about a deadline day loan move for the 23-year-old centre half. If we move on to the fixtures in the championship at Tynecastle, it finished Hearts 1, Dunfermline 0. Hearts maintain their push towards an instant return to the Scottish Premiership with a narrow vi- narrow victory over rivals at Dunfermline. It was substitute Jamie Walker that notched up the winning goal late on in the match. How pivotal, looking back now, Anthony, if we look back, how pivotal a signing for Hearts has been Craig Gordon this season? Um, I, He's been a great signing, obviously. Um, I think Hearts would still be top of the league even without him. But yeah, he has been pivotal in certain games. He was obviously pivotal in the semi-final against Hibs. Um, I think he's just he's been a, an obvious sign-in from Hart. I mean, as soon as you find out that Craig Gordon's available, you go for him. Although Celtic clearly didn't think that way. And I think that's to their eternal detriment. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think Hearts needed Craig Gordon to win the Scottish Championship. But I dare say if you put Craig Gordon in the Hearts team last season, they wouldn't have got relegated. Uh, he's proven his quality on a pretty regular basis. Um and that was another astonishing save at the weekend. And it's, I suppose if that goes in, Dunfermline take the lead and maybe win that game. And suddenly you've got a wee bit of a championship race if it ends up 1-0 to Dunfermline. Um, so you could look at it that way and say it has been a pivotal signing. But yeah, he's been a, bottom line is he's been a fantastic signing, very dependable. And he doesn't look like he's, even though he's 38 year old, he doesn't look like he's slowing down. He looks like, I mean, he looks like a guy who's going to play well into his 40s and at a good level, unless something happens injury-wise or whatever. He certainly looks like he's still got plenty left. I mean, I don't know how a goalkeeper's body works, whether they they do fade in a pretty bad way once they go beyond 40. But I mean, certainly he's, he doesn't resemble a guy who's coming close to the end of his career. So I think Hearts can be pretty confident that they're going to have a reliable goalkeeper between the sticks for the next couple of seasons all being well. Yeah, absolutely. And Hearts have done a, a couple of transfer uh, deadline sort of signings, Stephen. Uh, I know that they've brought in Coventry City winger, is it Gervain Castanier, subject to international clearance. Who else have they brought in? They've brought in a second player as well, haven't they? Um, they the Irish Aaron, midfielder. Uh, yeah, an Irish midfielder who I don't know how to pronounce his second name. McKinney. Uh, so McKinney. Yeah. For Shamrock yeah. Rovers. Yeah, so th- this is a guy who is very highly rated. Um, I think Hearts have paid... Well, if, if if you look at the the story, somewhere between one hundred seventy five and two hundred fifty thousand to bring this guy in, which in a market where 
teams like Aberdeen are cutting their budget and bringing in loan players. Celtic are not bringing in anybody permanently. For Hearts to go and spend that sort of money on a on a midfielder um, shows a bit of they've got a bit of ambition about them. So fair play to Anne Budge for doing that. Um, but this is signing, especially the, the the Irish midfielder is it's all about Joe Savage from reading between the lines. The the, the new director of football, the the. The first line of the the story on the Hearts website basically said that Joe Savage has been tracking this guy for four years. He's a guy that he looked at for Preston, but he potentially wasn't quite at that level. But for him to come to to us, he's at a good age. He's he's ambitious. He's just been uh, called up for the full Republic Ireland. Well, he he was called up earlier in two thousand and twenty for the full Irish squad. Um, so for him to get that sort of a call up and playing in, in the League of Ireland, he, he must have been doing something pretty spectacular. The only thing I can say about this guy is I've watched a, a YouTube compilation and I know that they're not always the most reliable sources, but I haven't come across anybody yet on Twitter or, or, or Facebook or anything that's that said anything negative about him as a, as a player or a person. So it, it's one of these ones where you, you really hope that it's it, it could be he could be another Paul Hartley, Colin Cameron type player that goes box to box and scores goals, gets beyond the striker, puts in a shift. Is exactly what we're what we're missing at the moment because we have a lot of sort of hard working, technically good players in the middle of the park, but we don't have anyone with running power really. We don't have anyone who who just like runs in straight lines. So it's just you've got you've got wingers and you've got attacking midfielders who are, who are technically good on the ball, but you just really need somebody who's up and down, up and down. Um, similar to what Livingston have got with like of Pittman and stuff in the middle of the park, we just don't have anybody like that. So uh, hopefully he'll be a really good sign. And I think the 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 winger from Coventry again don't really know an awful lot about him. So so a, a bit a few bits and pieces looks looks good. Big strong guy, like not your typical winger, um, and seems seems very confident. He was he again being linked with quite a few clubs down south. So yeah, two bit two good bits of business by the looks of things. Yeah, Anthony, would you agree with that? Yeah. I think uh, certainly the uh, McInef looks like an exciting one. I mean, you, you look at the response of the Shamrock Rovers fans, they're clearly gutted that he's left, which is always a good sign for the club that's buying him. Um, I think the, the one caveat is that it's a pretty big step up for players moving from the League of Ireland to the Scottish Premiership, particularly if you're going to the top end of the or what you would hope, Hearts will hope to be at the top end of the Scottish Premiership next season. So that'll be a test for him. There's no guarantees that because he was a standout in Ireland, that he's going to be a standout for Hearts. There's been quite a lot of players and managers have come over from Ireland to Scotland and struggled, so there's absolutely no guarantees that one's going to work. But you can see the logic in the signing, and uh, it's certainly, as Stephen says, a bold one in terms of paying that sort of fee. Hearts seem to have a bottomless pit at the moment in relative terms. Um, as for the winger, I was looking at his stats today, and I have to say, pretty uninspiring on paper. You wouldn't necessarily hold out much hope on the basis of they've signed three wingers already this season. And apart from Ginelli, who looked a player in fits and starts between injuries, they've been they've all struggled. And I think this guy is of similar pedigree in terms of he's not really played regularly wherever he's been. He's had some good clubs in Holland um, and he was at Kaiserslautern for a while, but he's never really played regularly. I think he's played about He's made about 20 odd starts in his entire career and he's 24 year old. So I think that would be a concern in terms of there's absolutely no guarantee this guy's going to be ready to come in and hit the ground running. He's barely played this season. So I wouldn't be getting overly excited about him. Equally, Hearts have obviously seen something in him that they think is worth pursuing. So he must have some quality if they can get him on the pitch playing with a bit of fitness. Um, so yeah, I, w- I wouldn't go overly excited about the, the new winger but at the same time if you sign four wingers in a season surely one of them's got to work <laughs> yeah uh, and no, I, I mean no, no disrespect to Ginelli because it's not his fault he's been injured all the time and he has looked a real player when he has played yeah, well, results kind of went hearts his way because Dundee dropped points. They got beat 3-1 by Rafe Rovers. They stormed back to beat Dundee to climb second place in the Scottish Championship. Now, uh, Dundee did sign an old favourite of Hibs, uh, Jason Cummins, this week. That's another good bit of business for Dundee, Stephen, is it not? Yeah, you would you would think so. Um, they've The Championship teams are absolutely flying with the signings because, obviously, every team in the Championship has got that £500,000 grant. And I think they've all just went... <laughs> 
let's just throw money at everything. Like, Wraith Rovers went and brought Tammy Abraham's brother in for Fulham. That's right. Who, whose name is Timmy Abraham, by the way. He seems like a, he seems like a, like a, somebody who's trying to do an impression of Tammy Abraham. But it's a, uh, the, the championship teams are absolutely chucking money about, which is great. It's great to see. And it's good for Scottish football that these guys are. So Jason Cummins, you would think would have been, you, you, like in normal circumstances, you would have had every team in Scotland out with a big four. Like in the, in the top league, you would have been looking at somebody like Jason Cummins. Mm. But maybe Mick Paik is an ex. He's an ex team. Uh, or would they have been? Would they have yeah. been? Yeah, the same yeah, thing? they played in the same team in twenty. This, the year Hibs got relegated, they were teammates. Yeah, so uh, he's maybe thinking I can put a wee arm around him. I know how to get the best out of him, um, and I know kind of when to let him get on with his antics that he's he's well known to do. And went and maybe just say, "I'm right. It's time to screw the nut." Um, but I mean, looking at the ability he's got, it, it could be a great signing for Dundee, especially with the service he's going to get off Charlie Adam. Um, mm. But we'll wait and see. Dundee have put together a really good team on paper. I mean, that team should, in ordinary circumstances, would be expected to win the title. But obviously, with Hearts being there, they're not going to do that this year. But if that team, if that squad had been assembled at the very start of the season, I think Hearts would be looking at it thinking we're going to have a proper rival here. Yeah. Obviously, the first game at the weekend there hasn't gone to plan for Dundee. They've lost against Wraith Rovers. But I think uh, with the players they've invested in this season, they're clearly thinking we need to get up this year we, or certainly have high hopes of going up this year. And I think he would probably make them favourites going into the playoffs. I mean, to be fair, Dunfermline and Wraith Rovers both excellent as well in terms of one-off games. They're, they're very capable. But I think Dundee would be the favourites on paper going in, depending who finishes second bottom, of course, of the of the Premiership. Dundee United, right? Dundee United would be incredible. Get, yeah. Dundee get their revenge. <laughs> That's Probably. true. That's true. Uh, just quickly wrapping things up because I'm aware of the time. Um, Air United finished 4-1 against Alwa. don't know if you've seen this yet, but if you've not, give it a little Google. Alan Troughton scores a goal for uh, Alwa from the halfway line, really. Absolute yeah, screamer. Yeah. Catches yeah. out there, United keeper. Brilliant. So Air won 4-1 regardless. Um, other results was Morton nil, Arbroath 1. If we move on as well, it was Inverness Cali against Queen of the South, but it got postponed due to snow on the pitch. If we look ahead, the fixtures coming this week. Uh, tomorrow, we've got Three games going on. We've got Aberdeen against Livingston up at Petaudry, which is a six o'clock kickoff. St Mirren host Hibs, also a six o'clock kickoff. And at Rugby Park, quarter to eight, Kilmarnock against Celtic. Doesn't get much easier for Kilmarnock. Maybe Celtic can pick up some points. On Wednesday, it's Hamilton Ackies against Ross County, Mullerwell against Dundee United, and Rangers are at home against St Johnston. In the Championship on Wednesday, our both host Inverness Cali Thistle, and Dunfermline are at home against Wraith Rovers, which should be a great game. Friday, it's here United against Hearts. I think it's live on the Delhi at quarter to eight, was that right? Yep. I think it is on the yep. Perfect. And on Saturday, we're looking at fixtures. Uh, Celtic they play Mullerwell Hibs are at home against Aberdeen it's Livingston versus St Johnston Ross County Dundee United St Mirren against Kilmarnock and if we move into the Championship Alloa play Queen of the South Arbroath versus Dunfermline Dundee are at home against Inverness Cali Thistle and Greenock Morton are at Capelo against Wraith Rovers one game on Sunday Hamilton Ackies at New Douglas Park they play Rangers at a 12 o'clock kick off it's way past the hour mark now thanks for everybody who's watched the show thanks for tuning in to the Play On Podcast make sure you Join us same time next week for another episode. Thanks for watching.